everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Ben Wilder, director of the Desert Laboratory on Tumamak Hill. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's good to be with you again, and, and I hope you are well. Um, I'm speaking to you again this evening from Tumamak Hill, known in Atam as Tumamak Duag, Horned Lizard Mountain, on the ancestral lands of the Sabaipri and Tona Atam peoples. This volcanic hill is of prominent ancestral, cultural, and sacred significance to the Atam nations, including the Don Atam Nation, Gila River Indian Community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and the Akchen Indian Community, as well as the Hopi tribe and the Pasco Yaqui tribe. The Desert Laboratory recognizes the cultural significance of Chumamak Duag as the bedrock of our institution and our future actions. So welcome to the third installment of our fall 2021 lecture series, Tumamak Hill, Health, Community, and Nature in a New Era, in tonight's lecture, Stories from Tumamak. You know, it, the, I'm really excited for tonight's uh, uh, lecture. And the when the first previous two lectures, uh, we were heard from great leaders in, in our community, um, Teresa Cullen and Betsy Cantwell, and then Chairman Ned Norris Jr. Uh, last week. And, and now we're gonna hear from some of the great uh, social scientists and thinkers at the University of Arizona uh, about a study that has been done here on this space with the walking community um, that I, I think is really gonna provide some important insights and reflections on the larger topic of this lecture series, which is understanding that role of Tumamak Hill as an anchor point for our community during this time. Um, so back in 2018, I began speaking with my good friend and colleague, Javier Duran and his team about how we can better understand this connection that happens here, uniquely here really, uh, between Tumamak Hill and the, the walking community, the people that, that come up into this space. Um, and those uh, ideas and, and topics and uh, project concepts really took, took off um, through a lot of meetings in this very room here at the laboratory. And um, many of you will hopefully remember and actually maybe set foot in the uh, Morable Recording Studio or that trailer that was here in the parking lot of Tumamak Hill uh, for many months. And that really became the center point for us to engage, hopefully many of you uh, uh, watching this evening and many others in terms of understanding what is that connection? What do people interact with here? Um, <clears throat> and, and not really uh, assuming anything about the answers to those questions, really trying to understand them. We were also able to partner in this project with uh, Fantastic photographer, Bill Hatcher, uh, who was able to take portraits of many in the individuals we interacted with. Uh, we were supported in this work by the um, French uh, Research Center here on campus, focused on Pima County, uh, the CNRS uh, Research Center. And then we collectively developed these questions that became these interviews that uh, undertook for over a month uh, in spring of 2019. And so about 110 interviews in total. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we're gonna learn about this evening. So, um, you know, I've really been honored to, you know, have the guests that we're having tonight and my friends and collaborators from the Confluence Center uh, as part of this project. So Javier, Christian, and Michelle, who you're gonna hear from, and they're really the ideal partners for this work. Um, for any of you that aren't aware, uh, the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry is a research institute under the Office of Research, Innovation, and Impact kind of a sister entity to the Desert Laboratory uh, in terms of where we're positioned in the U of A uh, that supports world-class collaborative, innovative, interdisciplinary scholarship here at the University of Arizona and in our community and is a physical and intellectual home for the arts, humanities, and social sciences. I always say that when I need to know who's um, doing good work uh, on any of those topics, I go to Javier and his team and he tells me uh, who I need to talk to. So, um, that just a uh, little bit of rules for the road this evening that um, we are, if you have any questions during the presentation, as long as we go on tonight, please enter them into the question and answer uh, little box there in the Zoom window. And then uh, we, I will 
try to fold in as many of those into our discussion uh, later in the evening uh, when we're talking. So we're going <clears> to <throat> start this evening with uh, some remarks by Javier and a presentation by him, uh, Christian, and Michelle. And then I'll come on and we'll have a panel discussion, a conversation, and then uh, we'll pull in questions from the audience as we get forward. Um, so at this point, I would like to welcome Javier uh, into the into the space. Hey, Javier, good to see you. Um, Javier Duran is a professor of Latin American and Border Studies at the Center for Latin American Studies and the founding director of the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry. He is a specialist in cultural and interdisciplinary studies along the U.S.-Mexico border and a native of the Arizona Sonora Desert region. Dr. Duran, a three-time UA Arizona alum, received his PhD in Hispanic literatures from Spanish and Portuguese, an MA in Latin American studies, and a BS in plant sciences. I always love that last part of the plant sciences piece. Uh, he and I share that love for plants. Uh, Dr. Duran's area of teaching and research include the US-Mexico border studies, Latin American cultural studies, Mexican women's literature and culture, and Chicanx, Latinx, uh, Latinx narratives. So Javier, it's, I can't believe it's already been like three years since we initiated this, um, the, the, the concept and the project and undertook it. Then there's been a pandemic. And I think now this information is honestly more important and insightful than ever. So um, thank you for being with us. And anyway, I look forward to, to hearing about what you all are gonna share. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity. And uh, thanks everybody who has joined this, this um, uh, session. Uh, well, again, my thanks to Ben for, for going along with this idea. Uh, I'm a, I was a regular walker uh, to Mama Hill uh, pre-pandemic. I still plan to, I, I plan to go back uh, this fall sometime and uh, reconnect uh, with, with my regular walking. And it was precisely during, during some of those walks that I start connecting with Ben. We did first uh, a project with Tuma McKeel uh, about transdisciplinary arts. And that project was um, the beginning of a series of collaborations between the Conference Center and Tuma McKeel. And, and also uh, as we were uh, talking with Ben during those walks, the question was always for me, why do people come to uh, Tunamak uh, to walk? And that started a series of, um, of brainstorming uh, conversations. And it really became the genesis of this project. And last, um, during the last uh, presentation of this series, uh, I was reflecting on the words of Chairman Norris about the importance and the place that Tumamak has in the community and his um, invitation to think of Tumamak as a place of inspiration was uh, always welcome and also captures uh, the place of not only of, of uh, Tumamak in the community, but also in the history of the region and also in the tradition and culture of our native peoples of, 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 of our, our region here as well. And so uh, with that, let me, um, um, begin uh, telling you a little bit about the about the the project. Um, so we um, we created a research team um, that um, was comprised of bilingual scientists, uh, humanists, and social scientists, and we carried out uh, audio recorded 102 semi-structured interviews in a mobile recording studio in Ciro that um, in which referred to as the trailer, um, Ben referred to that as the trailer. And um, we can, um, thank you. Uh, and we, um, we had a, a, the open-ended interview questions were collaboratively designed to elicit participants' meaningful experiences, associations, and routine activities on the Hill. The questionnaire was um, developed in English and Spanish. Uh, 19 interviews involved group interviews between uh, one and three interviewees, where each question was asked to each participant individually. Uh, the team also uh, gathered basic demographic information from the participants by means of a short written questionnaire, and there were 
also 18 interviews in Spanish or about 13% of the interviews were done in Spanish. We wanted to be inclusive of uh, several groups of people that walk the hill. And we felt that uh, doing a uh, questionnaire in Spanish was uh, one way to approach these, uh, these folks. Uh, then the tips at the information station outside of the recording studio and with times of day alternating between uh, conducting interviews each Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday for March 12th to until April 7th or four weeks. And we did morning and evening times alternative, alternating weekly and weekdays as well. So all weekend interviews were done in the morning. And researchers also brought weekly reflected memos uh, to complement qualitative interview data. Uh, about the participants, uh, the total number of participants was 138. Uh, the participants were recruited on site. Uh, the research team uh, approached two among visitors uh, and explained the study. Uh, interviews were uh, from 36 different zip codes, the majority of which from, were from the surrounding neighborhoods. The average age uh, was 40 years old. Uh, average length of, length of residence in Tucson was 20.5 uh, years. Uh, in terms of uh, race and ethnicity, uh, we about 63 Caucasian white, 49 Latinx, uh, seven African Americans, um, eight uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, three Native Americans, and we have uh, some of other groups. Uh, level of education, uh, four year, most four year college or university degree, and then we have uh, an important number of professional graduates, uh, some with college, high school grads, and then a smaller uh, number of people with uh, less than high school education. And so the demographics of the study uh, were similar to some demographics in terms of ethnicity. And that also uh, shows um, that um, the site is a, in some ways a reflection of the community. And, um, I'm going to now um, also take this moment to thank my colleagues, uh, Michelle Aguilera and Christian Rubalcaba, who have uh, worked hard on the data analysis and they, they're going to go over some of the details of the study. Uh, I am going to uh, stress the fact that this was a structure uh, interview um, study. Uh, it was uh, done with the idea of uh, trying to get the perceptions and the, um, the interviews reflect uh, the views of the, of the interviewees. And also we were uh, departing from zero assumptions. And uh, that was one of the things that we wanted to do. So with that, uh, let me uh, introduce um, my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to first introduce Michelle Aguilera. Uh, she's uh, from Yuma, Arizona, a, a native and lifelong resident of the borderlands. And she's currently a doctoral candidate in the teaching, learning, and social cultural studies program in the College of Education. And she has her MA in education and a BA in anthropology and Mexican American studies from the U of A. Her current doctoral work pertains to, to issues of language within the context of education. And she specializes in qualitative research, bilingual communities, language policy, and education in the border. And I'm also introducing Christian Rubalcaba who grew up in Sonora in Arizona. And he's a research coordinator at the University of Arizona's Kaplan Center of Creative Inquiry. After receiving a BA in linguistics and an MA from English Applied Linguistics program here at the U of A, he earned a PhD in second language acquisition and teaching. Um, his research focuses on language and place. And he has taught um, writing, linguistics, and Spanish for heritage learners um, here at the U of A and online um, and at Pima Community College. He has coordinated multiple collaborative efforts, research projects and online ar archives, such as the Lang Language Capital Project, an inter interactive map of formal or informal resource centers and meeting spaces for speakers or minority languages in Tucson. And he also did a project related to a binational re revitalization effort of the Opatan languages, the Wina, Odibe, and uh, Hoba. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Michelle, uh, who's going to continue um, talking about the project. Michelle and Christian. 
Hi, Javier. Thank you for that introduction. And hello, everyone. So happy to be here to share some of this work. Um, so I'll start off with some of the popular representation of Tumamak Hill. And so there's these kind of local and uh, national ways or, of looking or framing the hill that um, kind of shape its meaning and give the values uh, you know, that are associated with it. And some of these ideas are like that it's a popular hiking spot, it's an outdoor exercise spot, it's a historic landmark, it's an ecological reservation, it's Tucson's best kept secret, Tucson's beloved hill. And in one New York Times article, they called it a public gym, a free public gym, or a natural stairmaster. And so that really leads into what this study is about, right? So what identity or meaning does the community ascribe to Tumamak Hill? What are those values? Um, what are those uh, narratives that shape it? And though, um, just as Javier mentioned, um, that this was, you know, Although a lot of people shared stories, the focus was not necessarily on storytelling and more on about their own sort of personal meanings ascribed to the space. And so we focused on community perspectives in the analysis. So these are the everyday kind of uh, walkers who came to this hill. Oh, okay. Um, so um, one of the one of the things that we've been finding is that there's a lot of different meanings that are ascribed to the hill. And from um, a process of, uh, our process of analysis of coding, um, all of the interviews, um, we found that there were some recurring themes. And so we were able to sort of um, label or name these themes that were really frequent in people's uh, answers to our uh, interview questions. Um, in, this, in this presentation, we're gonna mainly focus on the community theme, uh, which was really prevalent. Um, but there are other themes that um, came up and I'm just listing them here to give you an idea. So one of the themes was of uh, nature and Tumac as a natural space. Um, also that it's a place for spiritual being and self-care. Um, another one was uh, saw Tumac as a laboratory. Um, another uh, theme that emerged was uh, Tumac and accessibility. Um, another one was uh, Tuamaka's narrative and memory. We had to do with the reputation of Tuamaka and the history of it. Uh, another one was Tuamaka's practice. And another, the last one was the Tuamaka journey. Um, and so those are ones that we're still um, working on and um, defining, um, but we can talk a little bit more about those uh, during the question answer form. As I mentioned, we're gonna focus mainly on the community theme and the subcomponents of the community theme. So the participants, uh, um, a lot of them uh, talked about community. That was like a really, really frequent um, topic in the interviews. Um, they mentioned that Tumac is not only a community space, but also a community building space um, for all of Tucson and that it broadens your perception about the community in Tucson. Um, some participants described it as a unifying place uh, where people can greet one another, connect, or just simply be a, among fellow community members. Um, uh, these can be strangers, friends, family members, or other frequent uh, visitors. Uh, participants also describe the community as friendly, kind, and accepting. Uh, people felt a, safe, uh, a sense of safety, uh, just being around the people on the hill. Um, uh, participants mentioned that the sense of community builds over time um, and many uh, people considered themselves part of the community um, and they believe that others shared the same uh, sense of appreciation and understanding of Tuamak Hill. On the other hand, um, there was a, a really interesting thing we found where although there were people who considered themselves part of the community and they thought community defined the hill, uh, they also, uh, some considered their, their own understanding of the hill um, and use of the hill is more accurate and more profound than other visitors. Um, some participants divide the community into normal visitors and eccentrics, regulars and temporary visitors, uh, people who care about nature versus those who don't, uh, people who understand the hill as a laboratory and make an effort to learn about it versus people who are uninformed or indifferent about that aspect of this hill. So in this sense, there was sort of like a um, a sense where people really appreciated being around people, uh, where at, at, at the same time, there was this notion that 
uh, for some that they were part of the true Tumamak community, whereas others were simply just sort of temporary uh, passerbys or people who didn't appreciate it as deeply. Um, and this is uh, reflected in this quote here, uh, which I'll read aloud. It says, I don't think everyone feels the same way I do. I feel extremely passionate about Tumamak to the point where, you know, when I die, I want this one. This is one of the places where I want my ashes. Now, this is my place. But people, but for other people, it's convenient. I think now people know about it. Uh, when I first started, it wasn't like this. It was all, um, there was a lot fewer people there. And, you know, that that was another theme that came out was uh, the amount of people that were uh, on Tumomak and how that changed over time. And so Michelle will talk about diversity. So diversity was one really big draw for people in the, um, why they kept coming back to the hill. Um, they explained how people all over Tucson, all color, all skin color, all sizes, level of fitness, ages and abilities um, come to this hill. And they explained that it's like Tucson, right? It's not like other places, comparing it to Sabino Canyon, which might be more for tourists. Um, for, uh, for Tumamac, Tumamac, was Tucson. And I think this is a really important quote that I'll read aloud as well. It says, I feel like this is the most democratic site in Tucson or the most desegregated place in Tucson. I mean, the way Tucson is set up and the way pockets of the city are very segregated. This is a place where you'll find white rich people from the foothills here, you know, families from the south side and folks, you know, younger, older, babies, kids, all kinds of people are all on this hill, you know, all different colors, all different sizes, all different demographics. Everyone's here. That's another reason why I think uh, community, I wish there was more spaces like this. And so this um, brings up one, how important diversity is or how big of a draw of the diversity is of this hill, but it also brings up really important uh, other points too about Tucson as a whole. And then there's also a community and a family, right? So it's about unifying and strengthening the family, connecting with family. Um, doesn't matter what age the child is. It could be, you know, mothers with babies in the stroller, or it could be teens, as this quote uh, is about, or it could be, you know, when um, when the kids came back from college and they would do this, um, you know, go and you know hit Tumamak together. And so it was a really like a unifying space um, and space for family connection. And just as this quote says, you know, it was just a fun thing we could do as a family that was free, that felt healthy and, you know, good. And we brought mom and my nephew when they visited and my mom really liked it. So we had this whole family in like three generations. And so this is not only about family connecting, but it's about, you know, varying generations connecting in this space and in this context. And just this also, um, you know, connecting with family, even those who may have passed. And so for this family, they they call it Tatamak, right? Because of a grandfather who had passed away uh, recently. And so the kids and the grandkids go and they uh, do Tumamak in memory of him. And they kind of renamed it in his, in his memory as well. Yeah, and the practice is sometimes passed down from the parents to the children, grandparents to their children to a visiting Tumamak. And so um, we want to talk kind of just, you know, carefully, but we want to talk about the health category. Um, it's such a large category, um, but at the same time, it's like extremely nuanced. Um, and so this hill was much more, when we think about health, it was much more than just this idea of a gym or anything like that, right? Sometimes people explain that this hill changed their life, that when they first got here, they could hardly, you know, make it to the very first switchback, but that they kept coming and they kept at it. Others explained that they use this hill for uh, rehabilitative purposes after life-changing procedures or diagnoses. Um, they also explained that they use this hill as a preventative measure to avoid medical procedures, often referring to it as a miracle cure or calling the hill their doctor. Um, they also may have mentioned that their motivation for coming was for health reasons, but then they, um, they also connected that to mental health reasons, right? And a lot of times they connected mental health um, with the spiritual health as well. And so it's a really large category that we're still kind of working with, um, but we did want to um, share a little bit of those findings. Yeah, and I'm gonna go over some passages in honor of the theme of the lecture series. Uh, and also 
um, passages that kind of illustrate the interrelatedness of all of those concepts of health, spirituality, mental health. Um, so in this one in Spanish, which I can translate as I read, um, I've always seen the hill as I look at life. Uh, when I begin to go up, um, it's like when you go down the paths of life. There are happy uh, moments or uh, there are good moments that are easy. And then when you get to the hills, uh, um, higher up on the hill, um, it's sort of like the problems in life or difficulties in life. And uh, as I go up, my mentality is always that, yes, I can make it. Um, I can reach uh, my goal um, and anything without, uh, despite the difficulties. Um, for me, it's like a therapy. Um, I've always seen it as a type of therapy. You get exercise, uh, you get physical exercise as much as uh, spiritual exercise. Um, another one in English, um, it just makes me happy. It makes me at peace. It's like health and wellness. Like I'm taking care of myself, but I'm taking care of myself mentally as well. And I'm letting go of all the stress as well. So it's done a lot for me. Um, and this one um, who had uh, family tragedies um, mentioned that um, they had been feeling, um, uh, have been going through a tough time. And um, this uh, participant said, I come here to relieve my stress and get that chip off my shoulder and just talk to myself. It's a meditation. I really feel like it's a meditation for a lot of people. Tuamak has been my friend for a long time. He walks with me every day I come up here. He's my friend. But yeah, people come here for, I tell you, spiritual healing. So you can see the kind of the overlap between um, all of those different categories that are emerging in this well-being category, well-being theme. Um, same thing here, the, the notion of uh, getting the opportunity to uh, get a sort of therapy. Um, you, um, oh, this person mentions that the most memorable, memorable thing about the hill uh, was that it was sort of like a therapy and a, a uh, opportunity to connect with her or his faith um, and also connect with his or her uh, health. Um, so this is a perfect place to meditate, uh, to do exercise and also to acquire health. And I'll skip over that, but if um, this is something like Michelle was saying in terms of like the miracle uh, healing where this person needed surgery, but then they started coming to the hill and then they didn't need surgery anymore. So I'll pass it on to Javier, who's going to talk about the next steps of this study. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So, so do you probably also have uh, noticed and Ben mentioned the work and the contribution of Bill Hatcher to this project? And that was uh, by way of having these portraits of the walkers and the portraits are part of the project uh, in terms of being uh, not only, we're not only uh, having the recorded uh, uh, interviews uh, with the comments from the walkers, but we also have uh, the visual uh, representation of, of some of these folks who accepted to have their portraits taken by, by Bill, who is a, a wonderful photographer and artist. And so part of the, of the project as well is to, at some point, bring together both the um, verbal, oral uh, stories or part of the stories and also the images of some of these people. So part of the, of, of the idea is to transfer materials to the University of Arizona Library Special Collections to create an archive that would uh, hold uh, the recordings that uh, came out from the project and also have a virtual exhibit uh, in, co in collaboration with special collections that would capture this uh, juncture of uh, voice and images uh, through that, that came out, out of the project as well and make it public too. And also we're planning a community event, hopefully, and Ben can hopefully uh, agree at some point that it should be done at the Hill uh, and so we can share some of these, finding, uh, these findings with the community at large and also with the participants themselves. Uh, we're hoping that that can be possible. And then the, the final thing to be expand the analysis, this still work in progress and pretty much underway. But at this point, we're happy to uh, um, get uh, feedback and, and comments and, and, and questions about uh, these preliminary findings of this very important project that we have here. Um, 
And um, I also want to take the opportunity to, to publicly thank the, the, the team, members of the team, obviously Ben and his team at Tumamak uh, Hill, uh, and also the conference, members of the conference center team and the people that participated, Yadira Caballero, Yasmin Vasquez, Emma Bach, Lloyd Choi, Cecil Davis Vasquez, uh, Leslie Cho Newman, Bill Hatcher, uh, obviously, and Lisa Langland Duberry. We really thank her for their, for their support during this uh, project and during the interview process that, that it was undertaken uh, now probably two years ago, uh, as, as Ben mentioned. Um, so with that, I think we can uh, move to uh, questions. Uh, and Ben, is, I know is coming back to, to start a conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Javier. And Christiana and Michelle, feel free to uh, turn your videos on and, and join us as well. Uh, that was such a great overview and insight and not easy to do in the, I, I, I know, I think what well, we've talked about it, it's an overwhelming amount of material that was collected uh, in a rather short amount of time uh, and, and, and really robust. Um, so thank you for that, that really beautiful over, overview. Um, you know, to start us off, I guess, the, as we've talked about, the goal of the project was to begin to understand that connection between people in this space. And, and it, both Javier and I mentioned it, you know, without making any assumptions, not like, what animals did you see? Are you seeing the animals, right? Well, what do you, what, what just no, no pre, pre assumptions. So I guess, Javier, you know, at this point, what are some of the major takeaways that you, you've come away with that either they're surprised you or I don't know if maybe there were some expectations you had from your personal interactions with the space over the years that those themes emerged from, from the conversations. I think one, one of the, I guess, confirmations, if you will, uh, is, is the fact that uh, Tumamak is a microcosm of, of Tucson. And, and I think that the evidence during the interviews time and time again demonstrated that in different ways. So I, 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 it, if we can call it the big takeaway would be that. Uh, and then also for me would be the, the, the confirmation of the importance in terms of uh, health and well-being of the hill as a site uh, in which as Michelle was um, commenting, people have uh, a connection, feel a strong connection and they are the ones that ascribe meaning to the hill rather than the other way around. So uh, that to me, that, that, that's, that it's, it's a confirmation, but it's also a testimony that our community, we have a very, uh, I would call a very smart community that is also really, really, really um, uh, committed to make sure that they are part of, the, that the community itself uh, serves a purpose. And so this idea also of networking, uh, from my perspective, is very important. Some of the interviews that we did were um, joined with more than one person. And it was really interesting because these people came together and they wanted to be interviewed together. So that also speaks to this idea of community building and networking that the interviews show uh, happening at different levels. Even individuals who were just in their own journey through um, the hill also talk about this uh, networking and this connection at different levels. Um, Christian and Michelle, do you have to add or? Yeah, um, something that was going through my mind as I, we were going through all of this, you know, transcribing and coding and trying to write up some of the stuff is the idea of connection as well, right? But more like to um, like connecting with self, connecting with family, connecting with community, connecting with nature, um, connecting with this God or spirituality, like this this space for the Tumak space for connection, right? Like really, um, just like the space, the site for connection in all these different kinds of ways. And, and I think Javier mentioned that uh, it was a microcosm for Tucson, which I, I was very surprised by. And I haven't, the fact that it draws so much of its identity from, uh, from the surrounding city. At first, like I saw 
one interview he talked about it and I thought it was interesting but just keep seeing it over and over and over again throughout the answers it's like wow it's a really uh important uh point and uh in some cases it was specifically not just Tucson but the surrounding neighborhoods uh um and the people who uh this like Menlo Park, Barrio Hollywood, all, all those areas and the people who grew up there too um that is sort of like the identity of Tumac is uh is the west side for them um so there's there's these a lot of ways in which this 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 hill represents uh the community around it um, so yeah that's a great yeah wow well, um I mean, a little bit related to that you know Michelle we you you gave in a really nice again you know initial overview presentation thinking about the theme of health and spiritual well-being and how it surfaced in so many of these conversations and, and the nuances there and you know the, I don't intend for this to be a challenging question but as you're talking if and we can all kind of weigh in on this I was curious if there if in your research or thinking if there like are any parallels with other sites you know any sites like at the national level, international level, large, big, whatever, that may encompass such a broad range of reactions or connections on that theme. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, nothing's coming to mind, but maybe that's just because I have Tumamak on the mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think that at least in the past, in the in the literature we used to kind of uh, model the study, mm -hmm. uh, th there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of similarities in the kinds of findings that they have. But I think one of the sort of really unique things about it was the the, the things we mentioned just now is this sort of reflection of the local community, the the draw of diversity, all of those things is like um, what really makes this place unique to a certain extent, uh, at least compared to other similar studies. What was um, the model you were referring to? Oh, there was a, a place meeting studies, uh, sort of like uh, ethnographic studies of other uh, natural areas, protected areas and uh, pl pe places that people visit to kind of get away and stuff. And um, in a lot of those cases, it was sort of like about nature and sort of connecting to nature and th things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't see, at least in the ones that I had read about, um, uh, this this sort of level of connection to the community and the surrounding mm -hmm. community. Um, so that I thought that was a pretty uh, something that stood out about uh, about this, this place. Yeah. In some of the themes that were the undercurrents that were popping out to me when you were discussing this were similar to what Javier referenced in some of Chairman Norris's words last time in terms of that you know spirituality broadly defined that that um, yeah, that real connection to the greater, the, the other, the, the greater life forces. You know, um, I think religion has a large part of that, but even broader than that. And so thinking, I mean, there's so many elements of that kind of spiritual connection that I think other religious sites may have, but, it, but with the physical component on top of that. Yeah, very interesting. For the spirituality stuff, um, we actually, uh, that was a, a really big one, and we divided that into two categories. Um, one was specifically speaking about spirit, spirituality that came from uh, the connection to nature, and, um, and that included, you know, flora and fauna. Uh, on the other hand, there was a sort of more general uh, category, which which a lot of times came from this this idea, this the like the physical features of the hill itself, whether it was like the path or this sense of accomplishment or freedom or something like that, and or sometimes sort of like these serendipitous experiences, uh, this sense of introspection, just walking through the space, uh, silence, um, uh, being part of a community, all those things are sort of interconnected with this notion of spirituality. And, and yeah, like you mentioned, in some cases, they compared it to other religious sites as well, um, a few of the participants. You know, Christian, I'm, I'm curious when you all were doing the coding and processing and you were kind of tracking words, topics, phrases, maybe at the kind of more micro level, like that real, the, the more parsed out level you did, what were some of the most frequent topics or words that, that came up? 
um, that we may, you know, yeah, just kind of, I'm, I'm very curious what, what were, you know, the common words that people would just say that jumped across interviews? Yeah, I'll let Michelle. Yeah, one, um, <laughs> one thing that was mentioned almost oh, just so much was this idea of mothers pushing babies in the stroller. That was just something that people uh, recognize as like quite a feat. I mean, you know, getting yourself up to Mamak is one thing, but another person in a stroller like is something, um, yeah. So I can tell you that I am relating to that <laughs> very much right now. My wife and I right. there pushing our three month old Eli um, up and down the hill. And I thought it was a workout before. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. That, yes, so that amazing. is something that stands out a lot in the interviews. Yeah, that and and the every time we would ask, so what what sorts of people come to Tuama? Everybody, almost every single time, people would start out with all kinds. Like <laughs> we could just predict that uh, what was going to be the answer after like maybe fifteen interviews. Uh, yeah, so the the babies in the strollers um, was a was a big one. <laughs> Fun. Thank you. You know, so one of the goals that I have for the Desert Lab is to help connect our larger community, you know, to the multiple layers of interaction, history, perspectives that coexist in time and space here on Chimamok. Uh, I also know that a majority of the people that walk up and down the hill are not necessarily aware of these layers. I often put that percentage uh, north of 90 of 90%. I'm kind of curious in, in what did you find in these interviews regarding where people are coming from in their knowledge of, of this space? Like, were there consistencies in that or was it highly variable and personal? You know, you referenced this question a bit in your presentation of uh, almost that, I think you kind of clarified it is people will come at this with different knowledge displays and almost using that as a hierarchy of, well, I know this space better than someone else, but I'm, yeah, so I, I guess my question is really at the, what is the average kind of where people are coming at from the space, but it, and then what is the, where's the gradient um, within that? So we don't have like, uh, like a quantitative uh, summary of, of, of uh, how frequent a theme was. We did, the ones that we uh, turned, the ones that became themes were the ones that were fairly frequent, um, but we, we did notice that there was a, 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 lack of, um, a lack of familiarity with what's being done uh, by the desert laboratory in some cases. So we, we had a theme called uh, uh, institutional presence, uh, one of the sub themes. And in this one we had, uh, we looked at the perceptions and the roles of uh, and contributions of the institutional presence. Um, and so in this case, we, found that um, people talked about preservation, research, prestige, uh, people associated with the U of A. Um, so those were sort of like these broad conceptualizations of, of this institutional presence on the Hill. Um, there was a lack of knowledge, some criticisms and bad experiences with institutional presence on the Hill as well. Um, in some cases, uh, people um, had, one person had the notion that there was like, uh, either the buildings had been abandoned, another person thought that the that there was uh, harmful chemicals being produced at, at these buildings, and that if you stayed there too long, you could get sick. Um, uh, let's see, there's people that talked about in terms of the availability of the space to the community, um, the fact that it was um, inaccessible or closed off, or that uh, people could remember uh, going up there and um, having to run up and down really fast so they wouldn't get caught being on the hill and get in trouble or having to go at night. Um, so there was this, this uh, in, in, in the one sense, there was this notion of uh, this sort of like vague presence. Um, and then on the other hand, a lot of the interviewees would say, uh, tell whoever uh, is in charge here, thank you for letting me on the hill. You know, thank you so much for, for all of these uh, for all of these, uh, the, your work you do here and stuff. And so there was this really interesting, uh, in a lot of these themes, there's like a lot of uh, dualisms and, and contradictions, of, uh, a pretty big range uh, of perceptions of, of, of the Hill, and in this case, the institutional presence. Uh, thank you, that's fascinating. 
you know, kind of a follow up of thinking, you know, so what may be some of the best entry points for our efforts? And I'm thinking any as individuals that care about this space, we have a, an incredibly dedicated group of volunteer stewards who I hope many of you've seen them walk up and down, volunteer their time, helping us maintain that, that balance between allowing people in, but being a good steward of this space. Or, and, and then as me as director in terms of achieving our goals um, and to build people's sense of place. So, I mean, Javier, where would you point me in this direction? What, what are good departure points from what we've learned from this? So, so going back a little bit to the comments that Christian was making, there, there's also, I think we need to nuance that a little bit and with the fact that we have intergenerational, um, we interview people that through generations come to, to the hill. So you do have some of these uh, memories of restriction, you know, when, when the access was restricted. So those, those were, those came, you know, the, 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 those, those remembrances came, came back a little bit as people were thinking about their experience, right? Obviously, as Christian mentioned, that's how changed and there's a lot of appreciation from other people about the accessibility and the fact that they're able to walk. And also, uh, I think there's a sense of, uh, as Christian was saying, a sense of uh, uh, protectiveness uh, in terms of the access and also trying to make sure that uh, everybody becomes steward of, of the hill in some ways, right? And so, but but I think one thing that it was it was uh, another topic was Tucson uh, Tucson of reputation and history, right? Uh, some people see it as, as a place that is very linked to our our land, our history, our native history, and I think that's that could be an interesting point of entry. You know, how do we make sure that our Native American communities, surrounding communities, you know, have really the opportunity to. Uh, be uh, more engaged in terms of, of those comments. And I, I go back to the chairman's uh, comments during the last conversation that he feels that um, many in the Tucson community share that idea, but he's also mindful that it's not just uh, some communities, but every community should have access. So I think in that sense, it could be a, a very interesting approach man, in terms of uh, directing uh, a, a, an intentional effort to really um, educate the communities that suspect that it's a very important uh, set of, uh, that the space is connected to those communities in a more, more maybe coordinated way uh, with our native communities. I think that would be something that could be really, really interesting and beneficial for everyone as we are right now celebrating Native American and the Native American History Month. I think that that's, that's something that is relevant. Uh, I also think that that your efforts to 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 balance right the 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 and the and protect some areas of the space have been recognized as well, and I think that's 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 a that's a difficult challenge. And you and I will have talked about these these challenges. Uh, on the one hand, you want to have the community the access to a place they cherish, and at the same time, the our responsibility that you have to have as director, right? So. I think that that balancing act uh, has to continue in some ways. So, but I, I think there's recognition of, of those aspects, you know, by the community at large, as we're, 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 we're talking about. But, but certainly uh, maintaining access, I think is very important. And from my perspective, more educational as components could be really beneficial, uh, especially in, in the Spanish and Donald and languages, for instance that could be really, really valuable in terms of even having uh, a history or a history of Tuvama from that perspective. I'm, I'm not sure if Christian, you have other, and Michelle, other ideas, but I think for me, that would be, that, that's a sense that I got, that the people really want to learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that pretty much, I agree. And uh, like an intentional campaign to bring in some of these folks, uh, into the buildings, I think would be a really interesting. I mean, it can be open to the community, but sometimes at least some of the folks we talk to don't know. Um, they have no idea it's open or what is available. Um, so I, I just like an intentional campaign. Um, and then maybe like some of those community members who maybe were unfamiliar with the space at first and then became more involved could be part of the docent program if, if, that's, if that's possible too. That's a, that's a really 
beautiful way to put it, you, you all. And what you just said, Christian, in building on Javier's comment, that's been a very, con very common feedback I've gotten, a question of uh, welcoming, of access, you know, is, is this space for me? And that, that, and we talked about Chairman Norris, Norris last time, and just a basic question for indigenous peoples, if, if I welcome there to, you know, people walking the hill and know what's going on in there, oh, that's closed, that's not for me. Um, and in that intentionality of, of opening that space uh, while striking a balance. Um, anyway, that, that, those are all really great thoughts. I, I kind of related to that. I always think, you know, I'm so close to it and, you know, talking about on the, on the science side or the plant ecology piece, you know, longest continuous studied population, plant population in the world, right? And, I, I think that in many ways, that's like not necessarily the right entry point for people to say, whoa, 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 like, why are you studying that? Or what, what are you doing? You know, it's take, but knowing where that right entry point is and, um, you know, collectively this, this is probably the, by far since I've been here and I think in a long time, and maybe ever the most comprehensive approach to really understanding where that starting point is and where people are coming at, at these topics from. Um, you know, so one element uh, about this work and these interviews is that they were conducted prior to the pandemic, right? Um, so, you know, for all of you, but Michelle, we can start with you. I'm very curious, you know, what elements, elements in particular do you feel that these interviews help establish a baseline for? And what themes are you most curious to see how they've changed from um, when we conducted the interviews in 2019 to the different world we're living in now? Yeah, um, maybe I'm biased, but I think this research does a great job. <laughs> but it does a great job at really showing us what what meanings the community ascribes to this hill. It's this really great collection of people's feelings, experiences, memories of this important space, right? Um, but I do uh, think what might be interesting to investigate is the two categories that we actually share today, which was you know community health community and health. And so um, in this sort of pandemic era, I think community and health might have taken on maybe new meanings or maybe deeper meanings. Um, and I think um, what's uh, particularly important um, is how these two categories might uh, intersect, especially when we consider the sort of the isolation um, that we had to undergo and the impact that that might have had on people's health. So. Yeah, that, that was the, the thing that was going through my mind when everybody was on lockdown was because uh, we we were working on the analysis during the lockdown and we can actually see two of them up from our window. So I was thinking about all those people who were, while I was reading, you know, saying like, I come here just to, you know, de-stress when I'm having a bad day or when I'm having, like, when I'm dealing with something really tough, like I'll go to Tumamak. And I was like, this is something really tough, but <laughs> <laughs> we can't go, you know. Um, so that was one of the things that I, I was thinking maybe in the future it would be interesting to do like a follow up with some of these these folks uh, to, to kind of get like a, a Oops. We lost, lost your connection there for a minute. Okay. Javier, you want to go away until we get Christian back? Yeah, I, I think I think that's that that's something that we talk about a, a little bit about you know what what are some a reflection of, 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 of their experience. You went in and out. You're back now, Christian. Okay, we'll go. Javier, you continue. And then okay, so so no, I, uh, so I was saying that that that's one of the questions that I had for you was was the did the pandemic uh, had an effect? On the number of walkers and the frequent, you know, and, and that's I, I'm not sure. I, I, I in full disclosure, I, I didn't go back to right. walk, and I haven't been there, You're but I don't have to do that. And and on the other hand, I, I my guess is that no, I think that the the frequency or the number of walkers didn't change. Is that an accurate statement? Spot on. So we have quantitative data on the um, essentially on numbers. Uh, yeah. we, we, it's a daily count. Well, it's actually broken down by hour. So we, we don't have data on 
number of unique individuals over a year, we know how many people walk a day. And, okay. and you're right, our numbers from, so we had, we closed the hill, as many of you painfully remember, from March 2020 till end of May 2020, um, and then reopened with some COVID protocols. That was incredibly well respected, just as a first off, that the, you know, the fact that people took it upon themselves to not come here, given the ridiculous uncertainty of what the public health danger was at that time. Mm -hmm. I just, I mean, so we have an average of a thousand people that walk a day and we mm -hmm. were seeing a probably on the order of 10 to 20, 30 people transgressing during that time a day. That's mm -hmm. an unbelievable low percentage. Uh, and I just think speaks to this connection that we're talking about tonight. So I just want to recognize that and, and thank our community for respecting um, what was such a hard decision to, to close this space, knowing it means so much. Um, and then when we reopened, the numbers jumped right up in like May and June. It was crazy. We had, we were like 500, 750 through the summer. And then, yeah, in the spring. So we've kept, our numbers have been uh, right at average, if not a little bit above. So again, that thousand person a day. That being said, I'm seeing a lot of different faces and I'm missing a lot of faces like yours, Javier. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of people that have not been um, coming uh, or as frequently, but then in the last couple of months, I'm starting to see them back. So, so it's very interesting. There was this period of time after we reopened in May of 2020, where who are all those people that weren't necessarily the regulars or those before there, there was an influx of, of additional people. Um, and, and, and now we're seeing, I think some stabilization between, I have also just is completely anecdotally, but I have the, the pleasure to interact with many people on the Hill, just, you know, randomly when I encounter them. And I'd say of the last 10 or so interactions I've had with people on the Hill in the last two weeks, the average time that they've been walking the hill is two weeks since they first walked on the hill. Mm -hmm. okay. So a lot of interesting dynamics to in, re in response to you, to your question. Yeah. And I don't know, Christian and, and Michelle were adding something before we got into a speak up here. No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, I did want to mention, uh, send a shout out to all of the Participants, I sent an email to all of them to invite them. Uh, so if you were interviewed, just say thank you for, for coming. So at this point, you know, we'll um, pivot to any questions from the audience that, that you may have. And um, so get those in. I don't think they have too many yet, but a, a note just on your, um, your point, uh, Christian, this is a, Bill Hatcher is in attendance tonight. And, and Bill, I'll just, it was a beautiful comment here. I'll just read it. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. I just wanted to say that making these portraits was incredibly reward, rewarding for me. And your synthesis of the feelings of community really resonated with my conversations with the people whose portraits I was taking. Um, so Bill, thank you for that. And, and I just feel like we are just barely skimmed the surface of what we can do with this collective project. And especially the beauty that, that Bill, you captured in your photos, um, you know, Christian and Michelle, you guys did a great job presenting those. If, when we can meet again in person, I was playing with trying to just um, project them in the background. Technology didn't cooperate very well there. Um, but when we can meet in person, just displaying those, projecting them onto the walls of the building, onto the hill them, itself. Um, at, I mean, we look to the community event that Javier alluded to, we really look forward to, to sharing that and, and creating a space where we can continue to, to hear each other's um, perspectives and, and see each other's faces. So that's great because that's, that's what we're thinking, exactly. How do we, how do we, how do we really re, reconnect uh, on, on the, uh, of that middle part of the hill and have the opportunity to really put that idea together about the portraits. And also, as you mentioned, there are new people that have come to the hill. So that'd be a wonderful opportunity to really, really learn more about 
uh, those new folks, but also the uh, returning folks, you know, about the experience too. Uh, I think that we, that, that we uh, as Michelle was suggesting, a wonderful follow-up in terms of the effects of the pandemic, you know, and think about uh, some questions that might help us understand better uh, what we, it is possible that in fact it was uh, that um, space that saved uh, people during this time of isolation, and and it it wouldn't be surprising to learn to learn that. So yeah, yeah I wanted to say thank you also to Bill, um, who was basically one of a uh, member of the research team, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if people know this, but. We uh, took turns doing interviews. Um, so some some of us would go one day and the others would go other day, but Bill was there every single interview day taking pictures. <laughs> so I just wanna say thanks to him. Um, maybe another kind of funny little comment. So when we do this again though, we're gonna have to look for another recording studio. So the this is just maybe a fun, funny anecdote, a little uh, not so funny in the sense that the mobile recording studio, that beautiful trailer we we're using, during the pandemic was decided to be sold at surplus by the university. So if anybody in the audience was, happened to be the person that scooped that up, um, let us know because we would love to use that again. Um, uh, yeah, and I also just teased that the, we're just activating a, a new space at the base of the hill, the, one of the historic buildings, uh, the Boathouse. We actually have our first uh, event in that space this Saturday for a, a, a workshop we're doing um, with the visiting artists and residents called uh, focused on future climate proverbs uh, thinking about climate change but this is going to allow us to have a new platform to engage uh, with the community and again hopefully bringing people under the veil of what the heck are we doing up here um, you know I, I at this point I would just say you know between Christian Michelle or Javier do you have any last comments or parting thoughts to I feel like this is almost a check-in right there we have so much more to do and and I'm eager to do a follow-up study already. I don't know when we have the time to analyze all this data, but what would you, any last words you'd like to share with us? Um, I, I don't have it. I don't think I have it. I guess I can mention uh, one of the, since it's called Stories from Tulumunk, one of the stories that I heard that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, actually, it was the last, I think it was the last interview we had and we were about to pack up and this person had been hurrying down to get to the trailer. And, uh, and so we said, okay, you know, we'll hang out and wait for you. And uh, so she came in and, and she started telling us the story where I guess one day she was walking and she was going up and uh, somebody came up to her and asked her, have you seen a ring? Um, and she said, no, I haven't seen anything. And, um, and she's like, it's a really important ring. I can't remember if it was given to her by somebody, but it was really, really important. She was like panicking about having lost it. And so she kept going. And then the next day, uh, the, the woman came back and was walking. And there at the railings at the midway point, she found a ring on the ground. And it was the same one that was described by the person who was looking for it. And she said, well, I'll probably never find her, you know. And then um, she said she, the person had left uh, some like notice it's the call they had found a ring so she ended up uh, contacting her and she was able to return it and it was one of those like really there's a few of those really like serendipitous type of experiences that we heard about uh, that was really cool to hear but we almost didn't hear it because we were about to back up <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think I if there are no questions, I mean, I, we just want to thank you and thank the team and thank our collaborators and, and, and the participants. Yeah. I, I, if, if the participants are, are watching this or will watch this in the recording, we really want them to want to encourage them to be in contact. Christian has sent emails to uh, all of them or most of them, I think. And I think that'd be interesting in terms of those next steps, in terms of the project with the uh, University of Arizona Library Special Collections and also that follow-up portrait uh, voice type of exhibit that would be really, really, really interesting to, to take a look. And of course, um, Ben, when the time is right, that community event, I think that would be really, really a way to, to welcome people, but also hopefully uh, celebrate a new era 
uh, in terms of uh, the community. So thank you so much for, for the support and the opportunity to share this uh, tonight. Oh, well, thank you. It's been a true pleasure to work with and learn from each of you on this project. So thank you. And I cannot wait till we can have that event and welcome all of you in. So with that, good night uh, and thank you for your time. And we'll look forward to seeing you for the last lecture in this series focused on the desert diet uh, in December. Uh, until then, be well and have a great night. Bye-bye.